All right. Now we can go on live on Alpha Geek Radio. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start the audio recording and uh, mute your mics if you can, because we have a little intro here, and then we'll be off to the races. So here we go. We're starting in three, two, and one. <laughs> This is Alpha Geek Radio. Visit tunein.alphageekradio.com to learn more. The following is a presentation of galacticnetcasts.com. Attention, Galactic Collective. The Sci-Fi Geeks Club is next. Please stand by. You can take part in the podcast by providing feedback. Send a message to galacticnetcasts at gmail.com. Call the voicemail number at 805-328-3966 or leave an audio message directly on our website, galacticnetcasts.com. We also invite you to join the Galactic Collective. All the information and links can be found at gncasts.com slash galactic collective. That's gncasts.com slash galactic collective. Now, without further ado, hear ye, hear ye! Another meeting of the Sci-Fi Geeks Club is officially called to order! Hello and welcome to another production of Galactic Netcasts. I'm Dave Nelson, along with my co-host, Brad Ludwig. Brad, hello. Hello! Also joining us on the host panel this week is Mr. Corey Scott. Hello, Corey. Hello, how you doing? Not too bad. And our guest this week is singer, songwriter, performer. She's released uh, several albums, including Vanilla, no, yeah, Vanilla, uh, Got to Fly, Something Fierce, Live in Europe, and Sketchbook. Her music is often inspired by pop culture, and she's written songs about Shark Week, reality shows, TV series like uh, Firefly and Battlestar Galactica, Jane, Jane Austen, uh, The Mars Rover, and Artificially Ripened Produce. Uh, she's had a very successful Kickstarter campaign and has been featured on the Wootstock Touring Variety Show. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Geeks Club, Marion Call. Marion, how are you? <laughs> I am doing very well. Thank you for inviting me to the Sci-Fi Club. <laughs> it's uh, an honor to have you here. Um, we're, we're ramping up to um, a pretty big guest next week. So you're like, you're like the opening act for Andy Weir. I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> yeah. so, Andy, we're uh, have some great mutual friends, but we've never met, so I'm hoping this will give me one more reason to, you know, send him scary fan mail and everything. <laughs> Who's your mutual friend? Oh, some good friends in San Francisco who have hosted a lot of house concerts for me, happen to be great friends of his. Oh, and uh, cool. I shouldn't name names, that wouldn't be nice, but uh, it's, uh, it's always fun when you find out that you're, you know, a degree from someone, but you still don't want to, you know, scare them. Yes. By how excited you are about their work. So. <laughs> well, let's talk about your work. Um, if people aren't familiar with your sound, what would you compare yourself to? Like, uh, and especially like the style of music that you do and um, that kind of thing. Describe mm -hmm. Marion Call in a, in a few sentences, I guess. I don't know. Uh, well, if you enjoy kind of serious modern indie folk sort of in the vein that sprouted off a long time ago with uh, Ani DeFranco and Greg Brown, then you'd probably enjoy my serious work, and I have a lot of serious work. If you enjoy kind of vintage musical comedy, like of the uh, Tom Lehrer and uh, Victor Borga and Spike Jones variety, then you'd probably like my goofy stuff, which is more inspired by, like, pop culture and films and things. And um, do, you, uh, do you play cymbals with your knees? 
Yes, I play cymbals with my knees. It's a little bit like uh, the opening of Mary Poppins. No. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> the live show is usually just me and a guitar and a typewriter uh, because I have a thing about typewriters. It's sort of my totem. Uh, I have seven of them now. I'm developing a problem. Would you say it's a, your spirit animal? Um, I would. I think that term is going a little bit out of vogue, so I'm not sure. But okay. uh, I think it would. If I were reincarnated from something, it was probably a typewriter. So I hope I was a very good typewriter in a previous life. Um, how, how, how is that to travel with, by the way? If you have to like uh, air have air travel, is is that a problem? Oh well, there's you know there's many different kinds of typewriters. I have my desktops and I have my laptops, and the laptops come with me on tour. Uh, actually, the latest one I got is a field typewriter from 1917. It's a Corona, and it like it flips out in this. It's like a transformer typewriter. Oh. It's gorgeous, and it still works. It's like 1917. Nice. Still works perfectly. Uh, so I'm getting that restored, and I'm pretty happy about it. But it's very lightweight. You know, fits in a little case that fits in my suitcase, and uh, easy to travel with. Uh, and then there's the Herkimer Battle Jitneys that I keep at home. You know. <laughs> I love that you made a, a reference to, to Mystery Men. I, it's the best movie. It's the best movie. I, I, it is an awesome movie, and I, anybody that says <laughs> they don't like Mystery Men, uh, you don't need that negativity in your life, frankly. No, you know, I think Jeanine Garofalo influenced me at a very young age with her sort of breaking the fourth wall stab at the end about people who seek out independent film and music and movies. That, As cheesy as it is, that... That changed the trajectory of my life a tiny bit. Thank you, Janine Garoppolo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's going to influence your life, that's for sure. Yeah, it's great. Um, so I guess my music sounds the most like a cabaret singer who broke away from their uh, uh, traveling show and decided to go off on their own because they were a little too nerdy to fit in with the rest of the cool actors. And um, and now I just kind of do my own thing. Uh, I get to play with some other cool people like the Double Clicks and Jonathan Colton and uh, nice. once in a while. And it's it's. Uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm 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 just indie. I'm just me doing my thing. Usually my shows are small. They're really fun. A uh, lot of stuff in comic shops I've seen. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you been to one of them, or were you just at the Nerdtacular? Uh, I was at neither. I, I think I just look like one of those guys who would be at those things, but I'm completely jealous. <laughs> I know Dave has <laughs> story on the show from time to time. Yeah, Dave <laughs> said that uh, we've got the big guest coming up next week. I would have killed Dave if I hadn't been able to be on this show with you. So, oh, um, thank to you. To me, you're the big guest. I appreciate that I'm I'm worth murder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is Canadian, so it, I don't think it really counts where I'm from. I'm not Canadian. <laughs> I live in Canada. I'm American. You what have you... claimed Canada as your home far more oh, than no. you're proud of the U.S. Oh, hey, a lot of us would if we could. I mean, yeah, no kidding. Let's be honest. Yeah. I, that's the whole Alaska gimmick is just pretend that everyone's forgotten us and uh, hope that someday <laughs> Canada will let us just kind of slowly <laughs> glom. <laughs> and next I, by I, Canada. I figured something out about Canada. Canada is like the nicer, gentler, cooler version of uh, the U.S. It's like, it's, it's like the cool uncle. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm not good with analogies, so that's all right. Uh, tell us uh, real quick about your Wootstock experience. That had to be a lot of fun. Oh gosh, it's I love doing Wootstocks. I did my first one in 2010. I was on a 50 states tour that year, organized on Twitter. Wow. And uh, Paul and Storm contacted me, and I was like, "Who are these Paul and Storm guys?" Uh, they invited me to my first Wootstock, and I, at that point, had I'd been a kind of a sci-fi and nerdy fan of things most of my life, and I'd done, I think, one convention at that point. They invited me to come to San Diego Comic Con, my first like real convention. Let's <laughs> start with the biggest one in the world, and uh, <laughs> and to be on a Wootstock at San Diego with Will Wheaton and uh, Adam Savage. So that was a little terrifying as someone who has never met and never really attempted to meet uh, anyone celebrity-ish, and the list of people there that night was sort of terrifying. Um, and I was backstage in a very, very small, crowded room with them, uh, and all this, a lot of us had to change clothes at various points. So it was, uh, it was a really exciting, fun night. It was everyone turned out to be people I could really uh, respect for their accomplishments, not just some kind of abstract sense of celebrity. You know, so that was really cool. Um, it did. Uh, that was definitely the most people that had ever seen me perform in one night before, 
And after that, I started playing conventions and comic book shops kind of semi-regularly because I learned it was just my people and it was a better place to sit and hear a concert and hear all the words than in a bar with people talking or in a coffee shop with the blenders going periodically to make (sighs) filichinos or whatever off-brand thing they were making. Um, And uh, so then I did, let's see, I played Woopstock in San Diego three times now and in New York and in Boston. And the Boston show was a Halloween show. Everyone was dressed up. And since uh, Will Wheaton was not there, I dressed up as Beverly Howard, which is Beverly Crusher's maiden name. I was Will Wheaton's mom. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Hey, thank you uh, again for coming on with us. You ready to talk some uh, geeky stuff? Always. All right, let's dig into it. The uh, sci-fi news of the week, um, and uh, I, I, I kept on seeing like a bunch of Star Wars stories. So I thought, you know, let's just make a Star Wars section uh, on, in the news this week. And one of them is uh, a rumor, and this is a uh, well. No, actually, there's two rumors. Uh, one is crazier than the other. The first one is that, according to um, the Twitter account of John Landis. We all know who John Landis is, right? He was the, what, director of Back to the Future movies? No, and, Animal House. Uh, Animal House yeah, Animal and House. also American Werewolf in London. He's He's been in quite a few things that he's done. Yeah. So apparently he, he's, he's really good friends with uh, George Lucas, and he was at Halloween Horror Nights Q&A session uh, just recently, and he said that Disney was about to re-release the theatrical cuts of the original Star Wars trilogy. It's something that us geeks have been um, desiring, wanting for a very, very long time. Yes, please. Would you guys go out and, like, buy Blu-rays of those? That is exactly what I've been waiting for to buy Blu-rays of Star Wars. I haven't bought Star Wars in any shape or form uh, or or even tried to really watch it since seeing the re-releases in the theaters. Uh, I've I've been kind of avoiding it and hoping someday that this would come back to us. I, I'm thinking that it's going to happen before Episode Seven comes out. Don't you think? I I think if it was going to come out before Episode Seven, we would have seen it by now. Well, we would yeah. have some idea of it. Here's my argument: Episodes, um, Episode uh, Return of the Jedi is Episode Six, so yes. it makes sense that that would be released before. Episode 7 hits theaters. That's just my guess. But if it's coming in December, right, that's right. pretty quick to roll yeah. out something up there. And to be honest, if you were going to put the, th- the, the third film of the trilogy out, you would kind of... The purpose of doing that would be to introduce people to the characters that they're about to experience that all the older folks like us were raised on watching. Mm-hmm. So it would make more sense that they would start with episode four, A New Hope, and then release, you know, do four, five, six, and then jump into seven. I, if they were going to go that route, I, I'm thinking, if anything, they would put out seven and then go back and release four, five, and six in the theaters, if, if they were going to do that. You know, give give the new crowd a taste, give the older folks like us uh, uh, the chance to revisit those characters and then people would be clamoring to go back and see those theatrical cuts as they were presented back when they were first released. Oh, you know what? I was just thinking, the next movie, the next new Star Wars movie after Episode 7 is Rogue One, which takes place before Episode 4. So that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right. And, I think and the, the, the releases, it's it's going to be more, at least when they come out with the DVD or the Blu-ray of the new film, so they can try to get uh, more activity at that point in time of buying more Star Wars DVDs at the same time. The big thing is always going to be when they do the big box set of all the films, and are we going to get the theatrical releases, are we going to get the re-releases uh, with the added footage, how is that going to work out? The other part of this is that Fox still has distribution rights to the original Star Wars trilogy until 2020, and continuous distribution rights 
uh, of A New Hope indefinitely. So some deal has to be made between Disney and Fox to get this to even happen. They're, yeah. they're, I'm sure that that's something they're working on or already worked through. I mean, There's so much money to be made here on all sides. There's no way they yeah. have not been talking about that for a long time. Yeah. I would agree I'm hopeful with that. that. Oh, sorry? No, I said I would agree with that. I'm hopeful that this means they have some faith in uh, the film coming out right now because I'm 99% sure that if that film was not coming together or not looking good or likely to disappoint people, that they would be releasing those immediately to make a mega cash grab before people are once again disappointed. I am I am crossing my fingers that this means they think they have a solid film in number seven because I, I would bet you anything they have just been sitting on that re-release for the cash optimal moment. <laughs> and not to be too cynical, but that's what I would do if I were them. And if they think Seven's going to be a good... F if, if they thought Seven would be a bad film, I think that they would have been scheduling these for immediately before anyone had seen it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. plus, Seven is supposed to be the return to primarily practical effects, and mm -hmm. that would be a big reason to re-release these films uh, in the original form because all of the digital stuff that was added later on if you're a fan of digital stuff, then, yeah, you got something more out of it. But for those of us who grew up with the films originally uh, with more practical effects, seeing that happen again in Episode 7, it kind of vindicates it a little bit more. So I hate to... Is this incriminating evidence, what we say on here? Um, well, uh, no, I guess it's not really. I own, but did not buy, but uh, uh, and did not steal, <laughs> but was given <laughs> the specialized versions nice. of all three films on Blu-ray. Um, which was a group collaborative group project across multiple continents started by a guy in the Czech Republic who found out his girlfriend had never seen Star Wars and refused to show her the new edition <laughs> and started to remake it from scratch and got help from nerds all over the galaxy. Um, I remember that, I remember that awesome. very well. Pretty amazing. So um, I feel terrible for owning those, but I will feel I will surely go out and buy the licensed copies and pay my penance when uh, when they're available. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's talk about uh, pre quick qu quick question. Okay. Uh, show of hands, those who saw A New Hope in the theater. The first time or second time? First like, time. Well, the first. Uh, Marin's at a disadvantage on this one. I wasn't um, born I, yet. Okay. So I'm sorry. No, that's that's fine. We're, Dave and I are just dating ourselves. Yeah. Really. Back old. in my day. <laughs> old and bitter. Popcorn was 25 cents for the big bucket. <laughs> no, I remember, you know what? I remember seeing the trailer for the very first time. The first trailer for episode four, the first time, and just going freak, just freaking out. I was freaking out. Like, I, the, the excited eight-year-old Dave was just... Uh, not, I don't know if I, was, I wasn't eight years old. No, I I you were, because you're a few years older than me. You would have been like nine, because that was 77. 77, yeah. Oh, I was 10 years old. Yeah. Because I was born in 67. Okay, yeah. I solved that. <laughs> I, I remember standing in line to see the movie. I remember a couple of scenes in the theater of the film, but then there was just so much that I kind of made up in my head when I was playing with all my figures uh, sure. later on that I, it, it was years until, well, it felt like years, until I understood exactly what happened in New Hope again uh, when they started playing it on cable all the time. Sure. Okay. Um, now that we've, um, we're feeling really good about uh, the original sequel, you know, being in its original form with that uh, great story, let's talk about the prequels. <laughs> well, Why? Well, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barry. What prequels? I don't know what you're talking about. You said exactly what was on. That's as ridiculous mind. as Matrix sequels. I don't know what this is you speak of. Well, okay. Not specifically the prequels, a character and an actor from the prequels. Uh, here's the crazy rumor. Making Star Wars is reporting that Hayden Christensen, who played Anakin Skywalker in the prequel films, is being trained for an appearance in Episode Eight. Trained? Trained. Like, like house throwing, trained? Like... <laughs> throwing him in front of a... No. Um, <laughs> that's just mean. That That's just horrible. I, I thought about this uh, when I saw that the story was, was in the dock earlier. As much as we believe that Star Wars should be a certain way, there are a generation of people who grew up with Star Wars with the prequels first. 
yeah. uh, and, and loving those films. On top of that, just from a financial viewpoint, Disney wants people to appreciate the prequels in any way that they can. So tying in the new movies to the original films for all of us older fans is one thing, but then they have to also acknowledge that the prequels happened, and they maybe have to fix that. I would like them to maybe do a special edition of the prequels where they edit a lot of the garbage out. <laughs> and um, The opposite of what they're doing with the original tri trilogy. That's awesome. Yeah, that yeah. would be really interesting. I'd love to see it with uh, some practical effects added back in and uh, some different... I, th I think some alternate takes of a lot of the actors, because a lot of them are great actors, but it seemed as if they looked through every take that they read of every line and chose the most stilted version from what the actors seemed to think was a light test or something. That was the only way oh, yeah. I could explain how you could get Liam, Le Liam Neeson and to look that bad. <laughs> I think one of the problems was they were acting in front of green screens the whole time, so it's really hard to get in the moment when you're speaking in front of a green screen. And green. talking to a stick. Yeah. Well, I think that you know Andy Serkis, with what he's done and uh, with the with the company that he's put together, he's really helped work with actors to get them to better understand how to interact in a green screen environment and get the most out of their performances. Because mm -hmm. I think that you look at the prequels, you look at Sky Captain, um, yeah. you look at some of the other earlier green screen films. I think it wasn't until you got to about Sin City that things started to get a little bit better for mm -hmm. you know mostly green screen based films. And you know Andy Serkis with the work that he's done with the uh, Good God, uh, Planet Everything. of the Apes. Yeah, he's he's been a part of so many different things to you know to help actors that are having to. Uh, he he worked with uh, Mark Ruffalo uh, as Hulk. as the Hulk. Yeah. Wow, I did not know that. That's yeah. interesting. Um, and he, you know, he was wearing sort of the sort of the the bits, and he was actually the physical actor as the Hulk, and then they overlaid stuff on top of that. But it was based off of Mark Ruffalo's movements. So <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, we're going to... Uh, things have definitely gotten better in that arena, and I, I am kind of wondering if they're going to do a flashback to try to... The only way that they could fit him in would be a flashback. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of wondering if we're going to see... If I understand the plot line right, they're you know, there's a new empire that's sort of forming, and I wonder if there's going to be a bit of a flashback of something that maybe we didn't know about, or somebody has a diary or some other information that he's left as Anakin at a certain point in time that wasn't really shared, but still fits in, you know, with what they're trying to do with the movie. So I wonder well, if they're going to act that well, out. Well, we could have a nice, like, force ghosty guy. You know, we've had <laughs> you know, the original movies. Sure. And you got added to the <laughs> Endor Moon Party Force mm -hmm. Ghost trio there. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I want to find out from our listeners if uh, people believe this rumor. Um, who knows? By the time we record next week, it may turn out to be false. But uh, in the meantime, uh, galacticnetcasts at gmail.com is our voice, is our email address. The voicemail number is area code 805-328-3966. 805-328-3966. Let us know if you think this rumor is true and how could Anakin be used. Most likely flashback. Uh, Brad, do you want to take the next story? Uh, yes. MCU's Peter Parker age confirmed. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> uh, this story is from Blaster.com. Uh, speaking with Empire Magazine, new Spider-Man director John Watts mentioned skipping the origin story, thank God, and spilled Peter's age. There are only so many times that you can kill Uncle Ben. Thank you. Uh, I love... That poor, poor man. Uh, I love the idea of making a coming-of-age high school movie. We're really going to see Peter Parker in high school and get deeper into that side of it. He's just 15 now. Uh, that makes this Spider-Man the youngest screen version ever. Watts also spoke about 19-year-old Tom Holland taking over the role. Tom was pretty perfect. He's very athletic. He can actually do a backflip. 
Uh, we don't have, have to wait until 2017 to see the new Web Slinger, since he'll be making his debut on May 6th in Captain America Civil War. I recently saw a movie with Tom Holland in. It's, um, it's called How I Live Now. You guys familiar with that? No. It was a pretty successful um, young adult novel. And he was great in it. He was really good. But a lot younger, because it was like maybe four years ago it was filmed. So he's 19 now. So if Peter Parker was 15 in this scenario, is this pre or post Uncle Ben? I believe it's post Uncle Ben. Uh, but originally Peter Parker was much younger than how he's been portrayed in films for many years. Uh, and they're following closer to what the Ultimate Universe was, which the Ultimate uh, Spider-Man comic book from the very beginning that it started when Uncle Ben passed away and he was Spider-Man for the longest time. He was still 15 years old in high school and just learning to use his powers, was just kind of getting to have a social aspect with his friends, with uh, Mary Jane and uh, a bunch of the other characters in the book. So it makes sense that this is what they're going to do for the movie, especially because I've heard the film referred to a couple of times how Marvel likes to now say it's our superhero movie that's like this. Uh, this one has been said to be their superhero movie that is quarter, sort of closer to a uh, breakfast club kind of feel. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, and that's... I'm very interested to see how they would do that. But mm -hmm. having seen what they did with Ant-Man, what they did with Guardians of the Galaxy, what they did with uh, Captain America, The Winter Soldier... And they've taken the superhero films and they've changed up from being just a superhero bash em up movie to something deeper uh, with the story. That's a smart thing to try to do with Spider-Man because it's the only opportunity you're really going to have to do that unless we get to, uh, say, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel somewhere down the road. Those are the best. Those are the best superhero films. The superhero film, but we're actually also a heist film, or we're also a space film. You know, those are those are the best versions of the MCU movies, don't you guys think? Yeah, I I'd think, agree with that. I think oh. the best versions are when we we really believe the characters and they devote a few minutes to understanding who these characters are when the writing's really strong for yep. showing us who these people are. And I think that's the thing they've been doing so well over the last few films is it's not just action adventure shoot 'em up. You get these moments of glimpses into real multifaceted, flawed, imperfect, interesting people, you know, and that's, yeah, at, at its best, I think that's why those films have been working so well, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm in for a Breakfast Club Spider-Man. They, they should <laughs> just, do, you know what they should do? They should just, they should do the exact uh, Breakfast Club movie, just replace the characters with, <laughs> with Marvel characters, and have, uh, who was the, the, um, the character who was, like, the overseer of the detention. What was his name? Oh. Uh, yeah, now we're all going to blank. Yeah. <laughs> That's that terrible. Should, oh, man, I haven't seen The Breakfast Club in, like, 20 years. That should be the Green Goblin, though, right? <laughs> Osborne as, as the principal is... Yeah, I've seen a couple pitches like that made for Batman, too, a Batman in uh, junior high or high school comic, a... That would that would be kind of funny. Uh, actually, Tiny Titans did that with uh, Slade Wilson and Darkseid. I think Darkseid was the the cook for the cafeteria in uh, the Tiny Titans comics. <laughs> so who would be who would be the brain and who would be the jock and who would be? Well, Peter has to be the brain. Right. Uh, I mean, the the jock would would obviously be be Flash, Flash Thompson. Thompson. Uh, especially if he becomes Venom at some point. Uh, is uh, Mary Jane the princess, or is she the crazy one? Mary Jane has to be the princess, and probably Gwen Stacy would be the yeah. outcast. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, is he going to die? Then? Oh. Well. <laughs> or they could just go into St. Elmo's Fire and screw it up in a completely different way. Yeah. I just I just can't wait for next year. It's going to be a superhero showdown next summer. It's going to be awesome because uh, you got Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice coming out. Then you have um, Captain America: Civil War. Civil War. What else comes out next year? A superhero. Suicide Squad. One. Yeah, Suicide yep. Squad. And Marvel's got a second one too, right? Yeah. 
Um, Marvel has 10 million films coming out in the next, like, the production <laughs> schedule is seen. Uh, uh, Doctor Strange is November? Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Because they always, they, they, they do it where they have the, the big tent pole movie and then they have the minor movie. And that's Captain America Civil War is the tent pole movie and then Doctor Strange is like the weird offshoot movie. Kind of like what they're doing with Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. All right. Uh, let's talk about Star Trek, why don't we? Woo! I'm excited about this one. <laughs> uh, the, it's And you should because it's freaking awesome. The Enterprise D 3D construction project plans to recreate the Starship in its entirety using the Unreal game engine, which uh, you'll be able to experience using the Oculus Rift, I believe, among other platforms. I think it's not just the Oculus. It's a number of different ones. Uh, the goal is to serve as a virtual museum where you can explore every deck and room. The site reveals that fans will be able to visit areas such as engineering via the turbo lift. Which turbo lift? The one that's kind of like... Um, the one that uh, is kind of open, right? That was the one that was in engineering, the turbo lift that was kind of like... Um, help me out here. You guys remember the turbo lift in engineering? Yeah. yeah. That, that, I think that's the one that took you to the, the top, top, top of the chamber. chamber the, warp, the warp core? The warp core, warp yeah. Core, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can walk from deck 36 to deck 5 to visit, to visit the Arboretum. Check out Worf's quarters and look out the large forward window on deck three. The sounds from the ship are meticulously recreated, along with voice cameos from Captain Picard, Worf, Commander Riker, Jordi LaForge, and Deanna Troy. The only thing missing on the ship are crew and families. So it's just you by yourself on that ship. Like that oh, episode wow. where the, uh, the uh, uh, universe kept on getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, everybody started disappearing until there was yeah. just one person left. That's kind of terrifying, actually, walking the entire ship just completely alone, like after some terrible disaster. What you should really do is check out this video, because they do have a YouTube video clip of walking through uh, the ship, and you actually start on the Galileo in an asteroid field, and you get and you come into the uh, okay. to the the landing bay. And then you get out of the Galileo, and then you can walk around, and you start at the dock. And uh, I know in watching the video, there's a couple of um, smaller transporters for transporting like some uh, some barrels and and other uh, goods that have come into the ship, and you can actually activate it, and it'll teleport out. <laughs> It's really neat. <laughs> and, and the video is pre-alpha, so it's only going to get better, and it's yeah. already pretty awesome. It's already very, very good. Is Tim Ford on there? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. That's right. But I, I didn't hear Guinan's voice, where I heard voices from some of the crew uh, on the on the deck. I didn't hear Guinan's voice or any voices in Tim Ford. You're right, though. It is absolutely creepy just seeing them walk around with with nothing else there. Yeah, it's very barren. At one point, I'm like, I would just throw myself out the airlock. Well, what's interesting is like when you're in the dock, there is automated functions, and there's actually a um, uh, one of the shuttles is actually kind of flying through and out. So yes. I, I I think that you know while they're they're just doing kind of the rough, they're building the skeleton and just starting to put some of the framework on there, and I think they'll start adding you know people and and interactivity. Uh, layer that on top of it eventually. But yeah, it is a little eerie being the only person on the Enterprise in that video. And the video starts with one of the themes. Well, it's, it's the Next Generation theme, but I think it's from one of the movies. It's not the the TV show theme version. It's one of the movie theme versions. Okay. Yeah. And seeing as how, how far they have that they can still go, I mean, optimally, we can get to a point where you can interact with other people in this that are actually viewing it through their Oculus Rifts or whatever they're they're using at the same time, so that it becomes more of a virtual reality situation as opposed to just exploring. Oh, you could totally have like a missions and stuff. That'd be so you could, fun. You could play Space Team on the Enterprise. That would be awesome. Best day of my life. You could oh. play Parisi's Squares. <laughs> no, because people get hurt when they play that. Yes, they do. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, bad example, bad example. It was always it was somebody getting hurt in sick bay. It was always from Parisi Squares for some yeah. weird reason. I don't know why. <laughs> A lot of fights broke out. <laughs> what was? The, uh, I was wondering if there was going to be a holodeck, and then I realized that the Oculus Rift is the holodeck. It is the holodeck, right. yeah. We yeah. have one now. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, All right, so uh, question for you guys: Where would you like to go on the Enterprise uh, with your Oculus Rift? Like I said, 10 forward, I hear some sweet, sweet jazz trombone and uh, oh. catch some off-time conversation. That's Get some life wisdom from Guinan, you know. They need Riker with the saxophone. Yeah. Or, uh, or you no. the trombone? Or Data yeah. doing, uh, or data doing uh, a poem about Spot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a or, simple uh, man. I would probably just play poker. <laughs> In the captain's quarters. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's what we want to know about uh, from you guys. Where do you want to go in the enterprise? Leave us uh, some feedback. Call the voicemail number 805-328-3966, or email galacticnetcasts at gmail dot com. Uh, Brad, uh, another comic book story in the news this week. Absolutely. Do you want to run through it? Yeah. This is kind of a big deal. Uh, Bill Finger will receive co-creator credit in Batman film and TV projects. Now, Yay. yeah, Bob Kane has been credited for a very long time for creating Batman, but he only did part of the work. Uh, Bill Finger was was definitely a part of that as well. Uh, DC Entertainment has announced that the man who worked with Bob Kane on early Batman comic strips, as well as co-creating Green Lantern and other characters for the company, will be receiving official credit for his work in film and television projects based on his creations. Uh, Finger, who died in 1974, made a number of critical contributions to the Batman mythos, including coming up with the names of the hero's alter ego, Bruce Wayne, as well as the city in which the hero fights crime. He was also co-creator for a number of iconic Batman characters, including Robin, Catwoman, and the Joker. Uh, last year, a reissue of Batman's first appearance in celebration of the character's 75th anniversary saw DC give Finger cover credit for his work on the issue, and this news extends that further. That's really, really cool. For a very long time, people have argued, well, if you're going to give Bob Kane credit, why aren't you giving Bill Finger credit? And I think that this is a good, a good way to, to just end that. Um, I, I, di I don't remember seeing, because I saw this story after watching Gotham this week. I don't remember seeing if his name was on the credits this week. But he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be on the credits for, for Gotham. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that they're moving for. Oh, God. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I was going to say, it's kind of astounding how, how common it seems to be from a particular era of comics for houses to just claim them and not be too particularly concerned with who actually came up with the idea first or who who originated like especially like side characters and villains that later kind of took on their own life I, I've just seen so many stories going by the last few years finding out who originally created them but in a giant comics house in the you know Silver Age Golden Age they were not that great about always giving credit to the right people so this is really exciting well they were definitely more of like a sweatshop back in the day right yes yeah, was... yeah. <laughs> Well, I the like the, I mean the true history of of comics. Comics wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't really be an art form, or at least not as early as as they were, if it weren't for prohibition. Like, prohibition is what propelled comic books to to the front stage. Really? Um, huh? Yeah. Well, what what ended up happening is prohibition hit, and what would happen is gangsters would um, buy in to like lumber companies that would you know, get lumber for manufacturing paper. So they needed a product that used paper, and then they could ship in lumber from Canada. And in those lumber shipments from Canada would be whiskey, 
that or other booze that was you know, manufactured in Canada and illegally yeah. shipped in with the lumber. Huh. So they just started the, all these pulp novels and, and comic books yeah. as we move paper? Yeah. That's and, no wonder they were sweatshops. you got to move all <laughs> paper, boys. Yeah. <laughs> you probably think uh, both Prohibition and Canada for this, not just because of the liquor being shipped in the in the lumber, but uh, which, which of the uh, Superman creators was actually Canadian? One of those two. They were from Canada originally. Then they moved to Cle. I guess his family moved to Cleveland. Right. I forget which one. I can't remember if it was Siegel or Schuster. But this is, I mean, over the last year or so, we we've, we've seen finally a settlement with the uh, Kirby heirs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're we're seeing more recognition of these original creators. I don't think it's ever been a question that these people were important, but at the same time, work for hire is one of those things that it's very messy and as we've had these characters like you said we celebrated Batman's 75th year uh, last year how many other people have contributed to the mythos of of Batman or Superman or any of these other characters that are also not getting credited for the things that they've created along the way sometimes they get pretty good deals uh, for a while you'll see things like that happen that's why Rob Liefeld is so involved with the uh, Deadpool Deadpool film uh, because he had the deal now you can you can say whatever you want about Rob. I like the guy. But it it shows that there was a time when creators started to get more powerful, and then, of course, they broke off and they created Image, so they could keep control of these things for themselves. But even today, it's still... I think that there are characters that get reinvigorated and sometimes uh, almost recreated, and the people who are working on the books aren't getting the real credit for it, uh, for how much they're putting into it and what they're doing. And it's it's unfortunate, but it is also a reality of what working for a Marvel or DC Comics is versus creating something of your own. Yeah. And just, uh, Marion, um, there's a book that, that I got that's really wonderful. It's called Men of Tomorrow, Geeks, Gangsters, and the Birth of the Comic Book. And it's a, it's a oh, great read. <laughs> it was written by Gerard Jones, and Gerard Jones uh, was a writer and a comic book creator and he's like big into the history of comics, and he, you know, spent the time, did the work, and and really dug deep into the history of comics. And uh, it's a great read. So, uh, Men of Tomorrow, Geeks, Gangsters, and the Birth of the Comic Book. Have you guys ever watched the documentary? I think it's Superheroes Unmasked. I believe it's available on iTunes. Not iTunes. Excuse me. Uh, Netflix. Does that ring a bell for any of you guys? Mm, no. No. Mm-mm. I recommend it. It's really, really good. I've watched it twice. Actually, I don't think that's what it's called, but it's a uh, documentary produced by PBS originally, and it's super, super good. It's in a number of parts. History Channel, it looks like. Yeah, what? from 2003. Yeah, uh, comic book superheroes unmasked. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's very, very good. Uh, you guys should definitely check it out. Oh, hey, uh, it's all on YouTube. It probably shouldn't be, but... <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's your news. Uh, before we get into the big question this week, I've uh, got to take a second to talk about a little project that we are working on to raise some operating cost money to cover things like web hosting, audio hosting, maybe some advertising, get our word out, uh, get the word out on our network, on other uh, platforms and podcasts. And... Uh, Cool way of we're, the cool way that we're doing it is we've got a contest going uh, in conjunction with next week's Sci-Fi Geeks Club with Mr. Andy Weir, the author of uh, The Martian, which the movie starring Matt Damon is based on, which comes out the next day on Friday, October 2nd. So Andy is a guest on our show on the eve of the movie's release. And you could be on the podcast, and all you got to do is just give us uh, uh, pledge a certain amount of money to our Patreon account, which is patreon.com slash galactic netcasts, and it can be just a dollar. You know, a simple dollar every month. That is super cheap for the amount of stuff that we put out every month because we've got not just the, the Sci-Fi Geeks Club, we've got the Alien Invasion podcast, we've got Brad's Adventure Party podcast, we have... Um, Corey's and Matt's 
uh, Podcast of Terror. We've got all the little small... Uh, oh, we've got uh, Weird World Weekly, that Matt Stein, uh, Corey's co-host on uh, Podcast of Terror, that he does with me. Um, we've got all the little small net bites, uh, the uh, Galactic Gaming, uh, the Who reviews that uh, Daryl Johnston does every week for each episode of uh, Doctor Who. All that, every month, can be yours. Well, right now it's free, but just uh, add a dollar to that. That's cheap. Uh, Patreon.com slash Galactic Netcasts. And next Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Is it daylight or standard time? It's daylight still, right? Yeah, still daylight. Yes. Still daylight. Yep. Okay. 11.59 on the 29th Eastern Time. That is the deadline to get your uh, pledge in for the Patreon account. After that, you can still do it, but you won't be eligible to be a guest. On I, I totally buried the lead. Uh, everybody who <laughs> the Patreon uh, up until that point will be put in a drawing to be on the panel for that, uh, version, or that episode of the Sci-Fi Geeks Club with Andy Weir. So that's the big Woo! deal. So, uh, Marion, after you're done here, if you want, uh, go to patreon.com slash galactic netcast. And who knows, you might be on the podcast again next week. It's very, <laughs> very possible. Uh, we want to thank a bunch of people that have uh, pledged so far. Matthew Ridley, uh, Robert Scott Norton, who we had on uh, a couple weeks ago on this podcast, Steve Turnbull, Jackie Hearn, Alicia Brenner, Amy Frost, Jeff Cutshaw, and J.F. Dubow, all uh, giving to our Patreon and all eligible to be a guest or on the panel for next week's um, Andy Weir version of the Sci-Fi Geeks Club. So uh, thank you, everybody, in advance for uh, pledging your amount. And uh, let's, do, let's do this thing. Woohoo! Okay. I really uh, like that the first two names you thanked were a Ridley and a Scott. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is awesome. That yeah. does work out. He totally planned that, Marion. Totally okay, planned great. Great, Yeah, great. you're on to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, since um, Marion Call is our guest this week, she's a, a musician, I thought that I'd uh, ask as the big question a musical-type question, music-type question. Ooh. This is... Uh, we could go on and on on this, uh, but I'm going to ask two two specific things. What is your favorite sci-fi TV or film theme song, and which one do you consider the greatest or most iconic of themes? So um, let's just kind of go around, go TV along. Only? What's that? It was TV only, not filmed. No, TV and film. TV and film. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who wants to go first? I, I I will start. Uh, TV is very easy. It's the greatest American hero theme song. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. <laughs> do we do we want to do a TV and movie for each person? Would that be uh, cool? You have uh, a movie one, I, I I do have a movie one, and it's it's gonna fit with the uh, the most iconic theme, and that is the Superman the motion oh. picture theme. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, that still strikes a chord to me every time I hear it. Uh, when they started using it in the background in Smallville, it it changed my connection to the show just from them playing that music uh, yeah. when Christopher Reeve showed up as Doctor Swan, I believe. I think we'll leave the singing to Marion. No, no, I encourage it. I encourage it. <laughs> If this last session winds up being a bunch of dun da dun da dun da da of our favorite theme songs, I think that will be a victory all around. So uh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I will interpret uh, each song that you guys bring up on this on this question. So uh, <laughs> you know like what? You really can't go wrong with the background soundtrack for Land of the Lost, though, because dinosaurs and banjos. That's that's excellent music. I don't remember. I, I oh, remember the no. Clearly, I don't remember the songs though. The music. You're a horrible, horrible person, Corey <laughs> Scott. Because now that's like popped into my head. The Land of the Lost theme. Ugh. Is that really sci-fi though? Really? I mean, Land of the Lost is oh, probably more sci-fi. Absolutely. Than I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It may not be set. Yeah. I, totally. I don't remember. How did they get back to that time? 
They uh, were taking a raft ride, and they went down the rapids and fell down a hole into the center of the earth. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I did like the slee stacks. They were awesome. They were creepy. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. So who wants to go next? I'll Is go next. Oh. Yeah, you go next. I'm still oh. agonizing. Oh, I'll buy you some time, Marion. Thank you. <laughs> you know... Um, I, and maybe it's just people of a certain age. God, I sound like I'm delicately saying my grandfather. No, you have to, uh, well, Brad. You got to do the back in my day thing. Back in my day, there was a television program called Knight Rider. Oh and yeah. The theme song for that. No, I was just like, it's it's <laughs> the '80s. If anything were to embody the '80s as a theme song, I mean, the Knight Rider is like. It's totally synth, you know? <laughs> Somebody's just going to town on the synthesizer and tapping out that theme. <laughs> and and then if you throw in, like, the sound of, of Kit's, uh, basically his eye, you know, that sort of, you know, that whole... Uh, that Doppler... That, woo, woo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, to me, that one that embodies the 80s in, in my head and also... Um, and it's seen, you know, a resurgence. Uh, you know, there was a Knight Rider program, what, four or five years ago? Yeah. Um, on Was that on NBC or something like that? So, I mean, they, yes. they kind of yes. brought that back a little bit. They, they've always, they have, they don't have the best history of, of sci-fi on TV. And I do remember it being NBC and just doing a face palm going, not again, NBC. <laughs> well, that was the same season that they had the new Bionic Woman show, which also didn't do very oh, well. Oh, that was, that was so... And I love Michelle Ryan. She's, she's a she wonderful She was great. Actress. She, she delivered, you know, she did so well, and I felt bad for NBC because they took so much of their promotional budget and they 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 just banked on Bionic Woman being this this big runaway hit and it was Chuck that stole <laughs> stole the season for NBC. That's right. Um, and actually uh Jovan uh, Strahovski was up for the character of Bionic Woman and she went, mm, I think I'll do Chuck instead and um, Katie Sackoff was on that Bionic Woman show, right? I think she, yeah, she appeared. She was the first test of the the bionic, um, the, the the properties replacing bionic, you know, parts and stuff like that uh, on a person. She was the first one that they did it on. I'm really hoping that that movie takes off. That's supposed to be starring uh, Mark Wahlberg, I think. Oh yeah. Six million dollar man. man. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be based more on the original book. What was it? Yeah. I can't remember what, what the book was called, but yeah. Um, I just want to establish, though, Brad, when you say uh, the music from Knight Rider, you don't mean anything where David Hasselhoff sings. No, okay. no, 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 no. I'm just talking that, that theme. I mean, when it starts up, you 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 know, I know that that's immediately, you know, if you want to play something that's about action and adventure that takes place in the 80s, you play that, and it's like, oh, Knight Rider. And I'm you know, sure your it's, brain goes directly to that scene of Kit crossing the desert on the opening, right? Oh, oh yes, yeah. going across the uh, the dried lake bed. Uh, yeah. Um, movie wise, um, That's you know, a I'm, harder, isn't it? Because it there's is, not a whole lot of iconic ones. Yeah. Um, well, there's not a lot of iconic ones that are not also by John Williams. Right. When yeah. it comes to sci-fi movie themes, you could just say John Williams and that would... Be <laughs> it's like, oh, you took, you took mine. Uh, and everybody would say that, yeah. Um, gosh, you know... Uh, I have an idea to solve the problem of not many movie theme songs, but go ahead. I think I'm going to go with the, the movie Star Trek theme. Oh, you... T you're reading my mind, Brad. <laughs> that, that's why you are partners. You and I are partners because we're on the same wavelength. Yeah, which which one are you talking about? Because there's a there's a few different ones. Um, I, I you know what I would go with uh, if it was me, I would go with Rathacon theme because that yeah. one is very different from. Um, 
Yeah. That was TNG anyway. Yeah. No, that, but that well, was originally on one of the movies before it was TNG. Yeah, yep. Oh, it was? Okay. Yes, yeah. Uh, I probably missed that in my youth. No, well, that's that's quite all right. Yep. Um, especially if you're talking about the, the original, the first film from 79, that's quite all right. Jesus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh... Yeah, the other thing too is like the the wrath of Khan, and it's not a theme, but well, actually, it's it's kind of Khan's theme from Wrath of Khan when he's whenever you switch to Khan's ship, yeah, and that uh, the the whole music of them being in the uh, uh, the uh, Mutara. Uh, Mutara Nebula, um, just that 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 fast paced theme where it's obviously you get that feel of of desperate energetic chase and and trying to accomplish something and then just that weird brrrr, you know sound that 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 kind of shows up in the background at certain points in the song and uh it just i and wrath of khan you can't go wrong if okay. you're going to talk about a, a sci-fi movie wrath of khan so let's just encompass that the theme the the theme that was particularly used that particular style for the Star Trek theme and uh, my my secondary would be uh, Khan's theme uh, when uh, in the movie of Wrath of Khan. There you go. I think if you, <laughs> if you heard the main theme, you'd recognize it though. Yeah. Like right away. Like I used to have the Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan like theme like the the soundtrack uh, for the soundtrack. it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I had two and I had four. <laughs> so much of a nerd I am. <laughs> I believe I actually had like a collection of different Star Trek themes. It was on a cassette tape too. Yeah, I used to have a tape. <laughs> Did you have any with the words? <laughs> Star Trek: The Next Generation. <laughs> no. I, I'm not making that up. That's a guy. Have you seen the video on YouTube? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, I learned I learned the words to the TOS theme because uh, Gene Roddenberry wrote words to the original theme just to screw the composer Alexander Courage out of half the royalties. Oh, uh, which is part of why Courage left the show. Um, oh. but, uh, so that that theme song has words, and they're by Gene Roddenberry, and they're terrible. They're so bad. <laughs> is, is that like Carrie Fisher singing the theme to Star Wars in the Christmas special? A little bit. Yeah, I don't. Oh. I have not gotten that far into the Christmas special. I started watching it, and even with Red Track, I just had to. I had to leave before I was crying. I, <laughs> yeah. like, real crying, ugly crying. I had. I had to turn it off. I um, remember they was so talented. I remember <laughs> seeing that very, very vividly, and having my parents just kind of we're watching this because you love Star Wars, son. <laughs> kind of look on their faces. You know, that's the only reason why this is still on is because you love it so much. What's the first appearance of Boba Fett? Uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. Not even with lots of alcohol, lots of friends, and <laughs> I couldn't do it. Boy, booze couldn't even save it. Yeah, nope, that's nope. telling. There's, there's, that XKCD comic is right. It's just too far beyond. Yeah. And that's also how the Star Trek lyrics are. <laughs> They're great. All right, Marion, yeah. are you ready for your two themes? I I think so. I um theme. Well, I had to subdivide it a little bit. So theme I most cannot sci-fi theme I most cannot get out of my head ever again for the rest of my life would have to be the Steven Universe theme, which I realize is new and a cartoon, but it's one of my favorite sci-fi shows that's ever existed. So um already, even though it's not done yet. Um, really for those of us who have no idea what the show is about, what is it about? And where can Steven, people find it? Steven Universe can be found, I think, on Amazon and iTunes. You can watch some episodes for free on Cartoon Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. Cartoon Network. Oh, Cartoon Network, thanks, yeah. And Steven Universe is about um, a sort of super-powered super... -powered, super heroes who have decided to defend Earth um, against lots of alien invaders and bad monsters. And uh, But the story is pretty epic, and it sort of unfolds through the eyes of this little boy who is a fighting member of their team, but still like a, an enthusiastic 9- or 10-year-old little boy. Nice. And the perspective on the story unfolds kind of as he understands it, which I think the only other comparable thing I can think of is Avatar The Last Airbender, which is equally completely incredible. Uh, 
but probably not sci-fi, strictly speaking, more fantasy. Uh, anyway, so the Steven Universe theme song and all the songs contained therein, amazing. Um, my personal favorite, which no one else might pick as a favorite, is probably the Red Dwarf theme song. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> because I loved that show growing up, and I loved that song, and my brother and I would sing it at top volume to irritate our mother. And uh, when we learned that we could get away with swearing in British and uh, <laughs> we would not get in trouble, <laughs> we learned all sorts of creative swears from Lister. Um, so, yeah, Red Dwarf probably has the most happy associations for me personally. There's there's Most, probably a there's a moog in in uh, used in that theme isn't there like a night oh yeah it's really it's super gross in eighties and like oh my gosh the production's terrible it's very like eighty <laughs> terrible it's so great I love it <laughs> oh man and we could only watch it on PBS marathons when they would stop for a half hour to ask for money in between yeah pre Netflix days yep. PBS was uh, a great source for like stuff that we couldn't get that that's very accessible now. Like BBC America has Doctor Who. You could only get Doctor Who back in the day on PBS. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I remember we we that's why we have you we have united around our common struggle of having to sit through uh, network you know pledge pitches, and uh, that gave us experience and practice for all of our Patreons, Kickstarters, and GoFundMe's now. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dave. By the way, I want a Galactic Netcast tote bag. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe we can get. Um, oh, I wanted to mention this. Uh, Daryl Johnston, who's been on this podcast, he's a big fan of the network. He does the the Who reviews and the Who news. Uh, he put together a graphic today and changed netcasts to netcats and had a bunch of cats on the on the logo, which I thought was brilliant. Like Very a nice. cy a cyborg cat. Oh yeah. That yeah, was great. <laughs> Maybe we'll I'll print that off and send that to you, Corey. That'll okay. be your, your gift for your plan. Put it on a bag. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I got stuff I gotta carry. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, back to theme songs. All Mary, right, last, last theme song call out. Uh, it hasn't been mentioned yet, so I have to mention it because you're not allowed to talk about most iconic sci-fi movie theme songs without talking about Star Wars, which has five or six of them, and in my opinion is John Williams' best, most consistent work. Like Nowadays, he's just asleep on the job, re recutting and recycling what he used to write. But at Star Wars, I think he was at the peak of his power, yeah. and he didn't yet quite know how amazing he was, which made him reach a little bit, especially in the first two films. Like He, he wasn't John Williams quite yet, you know? Yeah. And so he was still really trying. And I just, I the themes, multiple themes from that series are... I mean, talk about space opera. If you watch it without the soundtrack, have you ever seen clips of it without the soundtrack and how ineffective they are? I mean, he had a lot to do with why it felt so much more elevated than other sci-fi attempts of that time that had similar level special effects. So, well, you, if you watch the first trailer before the John Williams mu movie or music, oh with yeah, Ryan, yeah, 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 with other mu with like other music pasted over because the soundtrack wasn't done yet. Yeah, it's totally different. Oh, it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> so I totally think they should have gotten the guy who did the music for Lady Hawk. <laughs> no! no! <laughs> it's like having Tangerine Dream Room. Barbarella, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Ugh. I, my, my, parent, my father actually got the vinyl record, and I don't think I have it. I, when I moved out, I lost access to it, but he had the soundtrack to the original Star Wars film. And it was yeah, all yeah. Of, of, oh, God, it was just, it was a beautiful black covered, you know, yeah. it, was, uh, it had a black cover with, like, the raised letter, stamped letters of Star Wars, the the logo on it, and it was all of the, the, the score music from John Williams. And it was just, I remember making a mixtape with uh, the cantina theme on it, <laughs> and of course, it was like a mixtape, so it had like the Cantina theme in there, and then it had uh, stuff from Queen. And, you know, just, yes, it was like I this, want this mixtape. I, I wish I still had it. it I, just, I think amazing. I had the KTEL version of like movie themes, mm -hmm. so they were all just slightly different. They weren't the originals. You, <laughs> you guys remember KTEL, right? Oh yes. Was that on a track? No. No, they were like a company that uh, would, you know, take the music and they would have another group. Uh, oh, a house band. 
It's like a yeah, sort of a house band redo it, and then they didn't have to pay as much. They paid like the the rights to use the music, but not have to pay. Not for the audio recording itself. Yeah. So. Well, how how do you guys uh, do? Do you guys feel good about John Williams coming back for episode seven? Do you think it's gonna be he's gonna be just as good this time around, or now, or no, or not? I think he's gonna bring the funk. I think it's. Uh, I think he's gonna he's gonna bring it. He's gonna bring his A game. I hope so. I was honestly hoping for Bear McCreary. I ah, more drums. Need more drums and a little <laughs> more a little more alertness. I think. I don't know. He could. He could. He could bring one out and surprise me. He has before. I Maybe. I love his work. I adore his work. I just think he's been. He hasn't written anything new in a very long time now. Maybe Bear will be brought in for um, the anthology films like Rogue One. I want more bear on anything. After Battlestar Galactica, I was sold on Bear McCreary, and he hasn't disappointed me since. <laughs> okay, um, let's let's do a let's do a super cool segue because my my TV theme pick is the original Battlestar Galactica. Ooh. Okay. Like yeah. It it it's got epic written all over it. Like, and it's and one could say it was inspired by the Star Wars theme because it's very Star Wars ish. Yeah. And I don't know who the composer is. If only there were an interconnected worldwide network that could tell us. Yeah. It's like you're reading my mind, Marion. That's how I, <laughs> I like to phrase things as well. Or like there was a Wikipedia. resource. I, I have to. I, I haven't been. I, <laughs> I have not been. Stu Phillips. What's his name? His name is Stu Phillips. He also wrote the Knight Rider theme. Way to oh, pick it. Oh, wow. Perfect. Oh, nice. Quite the connection we made there. Yeah. Made a love connection, Brad. I don't know about that, but we made a connection. <laughs> oh, you guys are so cute. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, do, are you guys familiar with the original Battlestar Galactica theme? Uh, yeah. I don't know if I can hum it like off the top of my head right now, but I listened to it a lot when I was writing music about Battlestar Galactica. It goes dun 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 dun. It's very epic and just huge. For some reason, when I hear it, and and I don't, and I try to push out of my head that it's you know it's the Battlestar Galactica theme, it almost reminds me a little bit of like a country western. You know, if you were to change the instrumentation just a little bit, it almost has the feel and the pace of some like uh, like introducing some kind of country western type TV show. No, oh, like Ennio Morricone kind of uh, score the yeah. like, westerns and the the kind of big epic westerns from yeah. the seventies and eighties. Yeah, well, it's it's got a very it's got a, the 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 show has a very western feel to it. It I mean, does, and it, yeah, and frontier. I, I, yeah. And I think you know that that type of approach is you know what what made Firefly what it was too. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So my movie theme is a little bit different because it's not originally f for the movie, but it's 2001: Space Odyssey. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. boy, yeah. What which, was your... which piece though? Yeah, just the um, the main the the one theme that everybody the how does it the go? The fake Zarathustra. Yeah, that that's it. I forget how. It, I mean, I I know how it goes, but I can't think. I can't put it in my head right now. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So those are those are my movie and TV picks for uh, <laughs> best theme songs. Now, when I hear those drums, all I can think of is spaceballs. <laughs> Well, there is that. There is well, that. What would be some of the ones that we didn't bring up that could be on this list? Like, some of the Terminator films, I mean, they're... Yeah. Uh, I don't know about, like, my personal favorite, but definitely iconic. Yep. Especially uh, the second one. Those, uh, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, because yeah. they've continued to use that in all the movies. I don't know about the last one, but uh, for the rest of the movie, the film series, they used that theme. And I don't, I don't know about um, 
You know, it's not the main theme, but I got to give a shout out to the Divas number from uh, Fifth Element. Absolutely. Which oh. was so shocking and surprising and arresting and just heartbreaking. Like, what is happening here? Why am I? It, it, it made you react in this way you completely did not expect in the middle of that film. Yeah. Well, especially when it breaks from like opera to pop. And you're yeah. like, I, I don't know what just happened here. And my brain isn't quite fully. Mm hmm grasping this change but I think I like it <laughs> and the more you hear oh, it the yeah. more it's like oh yeah absolutely I'm just getting chills remembering it like what a musical moment that was and how surprising but yeah. that's very yeah uh, uh, it's great <laughs> so can, can we all agree on one iconic like what's the greatest or most iconic theme of all the ones that we mentioned I resist hierarchy see yeah I, I, <laughs> Well, I, it's it's so subjective. I mean, yeah. it's art. Yeah. It's art. There's no way to really get, I think, a general consensus on on you know what feels iconic and what resonates with you as a person depends on your perspective and personal experience. I don't a lot think of that factors. Can... I mean, the generation you're from too. You know? Yeah. What did you like? I said, on? like with Knight Rider, I'm sure somebody that was, you know, uh, that's that was born 10 years ago would hear the Knight Rider theme and go, well, that's weird. You know, <laughs> is, is Skrillex going to jump in here at some point? You know, because I mean, with the, the, that synth, that whole, you know, it would be deemed cheesy and not iconic. You know, I, I... Well, it made such perfect sense when it started being like something you'd hear on Nokia phones. And because oh, yeah. that, that was almost, <laughs> it felt like the same level of technology. It's, oh, Knight Rider was so cool that they had to technology that was like a cell phone from 20 years earlier. Yep. That that is what it sounded like. Um I can't believe nobody mentioned the Doctor Who theme. You know, I love the show and I love that theme for the feelings it evokes in me, but I actually don't think it's that great a theme. Like as far as comp composition and melody goes, like you can't sing it, it's not uh the middle, I guess at the kind of the middle part gets a little better, but the there are not very many good songs that open with a minor ninth. Oh, Valley I, High is probably the best one. No, 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 that's that's an octave. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh ha! That's that's a little wild. Uh, I like it, but I don't. Uh, yeah. Keep <laughs> going, Marion, if you want. It, it definitely. Sorry. It no, no, no. That was wonderful. It, it but it definitely evokes a feeling of eeriness and and the outside. Yeah. 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 Hey, how about the Twilight Zone, speaking of? Oh, yeah. Oh. That's yeah, iconic. I mean, it's, it, that sounds chills up your spine right away. Wait. X-Files as well. X-Files. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The show. <laughs> I asked my wife earlier, and she said X-Files. That's a good one. Oh, yeah, that's great. All right. Hey, we would love uh, the listeners uh, to um, tell us your favorite. Uh, which is your favorite of these, or uh, the ones that we didn't mention. Uh, galacticnetcasts at gmail.com, or, of course, the voicemail number, 805-328-3966. By the way, uh, we also have a way of leaving a voice message on our website directly, so just go to uh, GNCasts, that's GNCasts, C-A-S-T-S, dot com, and while you're there, click on the Join the Galactic Collective a little graphic on the right-hand side of the main page, and that will take you to uh, information on how to follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, become uh, part of the Facebook group, and also the link to our Patreon as well. There's different levels of the Galactic Collective, and uh, actually if you become, if you get the highest level, you actually get to help us make decisions as far as what we're going to do, the future of Galactic Netcasts, uh, new podcast that we want to launch. What do you think? Um, so it's kind of like an advisory panel in a way. So, uh, yeah, become a part of the Galactic Collective today by going to gncasts.com. Okay, one last segment here, uh, recommendations. These are completely optional, so if you don't have one, that's cool. I'm going to go with um, a book that I just got done reading, and it, I'm a very slow reader, so it takes me a long time. I started this like two months ago, and I finally finished it. Um, I have a hard time concentrating. It's it's really bad. I think I blame the internet personally. <laughs> um, it's called The Fold by Peter Kleins. Corey, are you familiar with this author, Peter? Kleins? No, I'm not. 
I was interested when I was reading your write-up, though. He did a book called X Heroes, which is, and I want to read this sometime in the future. It's a bunch of superheroes fighting zombies. That I think I might actually have that book. So oh. maybe I'm more familiar than I thought. <laughs> um, this one's really good. It's uh, basically about a team of DARPA scientists. They developed this fold technology, folding dimensions, uh, shrinking distances, so you, you enter one side of um, this ring, uh, one part, one, one place, and then you exit another place. And they never go as far, farther than across their compound. So there's, there's the main site and the site B, and that's where you exit. But there's a twist to it. All is not what it seems at first. And uh, there's a guy, the main character, comes in, and he's asked by one of his buddies from a long time ago to come in and be kind of an advisor and check in on these guys to see if everything's on the up and up because some strange things have been happening. Like a guy came back and didn't recognize his wife. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's called uh, The Fold, Peter Klein's. It's... Uh, how many pages? It's 200, no, 375 pages. So it's, I mean, I, I don't know. They're pretty big pages with small words, so I don't know what that equals to um, if you're reading it on a Kindle or something like that. But it's highly uh, entertaining, and uh, there is the possibility for a sequel. So I'm looking forward to see wh where, if he does that and where that story goes. So uh, it's The Fold by Peter Kleins. That's my recommendation. We'll have the link in the show notes, of course. Corey, looks like you got one. Uh, I do, and this is just something that kind of popped up today, but it was something that I was looking forward to a lot anyways. Uh, Jeff Lynne has announced that ELO has a new album coming out, uh, Electric Light Orchestra. And I know that's not terribly sci-fi, but I don't care because uh, it's Jeff Lynne, and he's amazing. And he he produced the B side of the uh, soundtrack for one of the greatest science fiction movies of all time uh, by popular vote, and that is Xanadu. And so... Oh, wow. Ha, ha, ha. Anything with Gene Kelly is automatically considered better than fiction. So uh, <laughs> his, they released the, uh, the first single off the album today called When I Was a Boy. You can find that on YouTube. It sounds spectacularly like ELO. And Jeff Lynne's voice has not gone away. He oh, is still incredible. That's wonderful. It I... is so good. I mean, and I I just saw a special, a couple of specials about him recently, uh, where he was performing live, and he sounds exactly like you'd want him to sound uh, by listening to the albums. When he plays live, he sounds exactly the same. It is incredible. It is just amazing. So I was super stoked about it, and I felt like I had to tell everybody. I love when. People pick a recommendation that's not exactly, uh, obviously sci-fi, and this is, this is that case. But it's it's cool. I love ELO. I love Jeff Lynne's voice. And if you really want to make a sci-fi connection, their uh, concept album "Time" is very science fiction. Uh, it's it tells a story about someone from 1980 waking up in the late 21st century, and uh, just goes through the whole thing. It's really just beautiful work. I love concept albums, and I, yeah. I I love ELO's logo too. It looks like a spaceship. On uh, almost, I think every single one of their covers, you see the ELO spaceship. Yeah, so another another um, connection to sci-fi. Yeah. Marion, are you going to do a uh, a concept album sometime? I have done some, and I will. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yep. And all my all my albums are concept albums. They're just discreetly concept albums. So. My rule is grandma still has to get it, even though there's a lot of Easter eggs. So. <laughs> do, you have char do you have characters, like uh, some of the great concept albums? Do you have uh, a character that runs through the entire thing? Me! Uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, <laughs> I do character pieces of my own and of existing characters. I, one whole record is all based on and officially licensed for Firefly and Battlestar Galactica and the commonality yeah. between those, because they were kind of... Uh, they, I guess they weren't airing exactly, but they were sort of culturally happening at the same time. Like, after Firefly was canceled, it was about when BSG started. And uh, those two were very much rising in awareness around the same time, and so that was that was a lot of fun. Can you do an album um, themed on Space Above and Beyond for me? Just for me? <laughs> um, 
Sure, I'm open to commissions. Uh, we, I, I do that sometimes. I have some. I have a Doctor Who commission I did recently, and uh, um, I'm working on right now. My Kickstarter backers for the Kickstarter I just finished are voting. Uh, I may finish setting up the ballot tonight, actually, on um, which uh, celestial body inside our solar system uh, I will write a song about, and it will be. Uh, uh, I have a number of uh, planets, moons. Uh, even asteroids and uh, exoplanets and a couple satellites that are uh, in the running, I think. It's is Enceladus fun. on the list? Yes, sorry, Enceladus is uh, on the list, but not too high on the list. I think uh, there was a shocking amount of interest in series, and uh, I like Callisto. I think that might be good. Um, and Pluto and Charon, of course, and uh, Voyager. A lot of people want a Voyager song. So, uh, uh, series, series, and uh, Pluto are, are hot right now, right? They're, very hot. They're so hot right now. They're the they're the Hansel and Zoolander of our of our solar system, <laughs> and uh, I think that's uh, so that'll be fun. But yeah, talk about concept albums. I don't know. <laughs> you want to talk about your recommendation? Yeah, I do. I'm I am uh, reading. I, I guess I'm reading a few different epic comic series right now, but I wanted to recommend East of West, which is still getting pretty popular, but still not quite as much as, like, Saga and uh, I think The Wicked and The Divine, but it's very much worth reading. It's by... Um, uh, Jonathan Hickman wrote it. Uh, Nick Dragota is drawing it. I read the first two, and they were fascinating and uh, sort of sci-fi western in a post-apocalyptic or apocalyptic future America, which has been broken into five nations by race because we ultimately just couldn't get along. And so there's sort of five different Americas that have divided themselves because we couldn't couldn't cope with being a nation united. And it was a really interesting premise to start with. Uh, and then. Uh, the question, I suppose, is whether people can figure out wh whether people will or can figure out how to pull together to overcome an, a potential apocalyptic future. At first, it was it was really um, there's a lot of mystery. There was not a lot of clarity about what was going on, but there was definitely enough to keep me wanting to read. By book three, I, my head was exploding, and it was so great and exciting. So I think there's four trades out now, and uh, it's very much worth catching up with. East of West recommended. Cool. As always, we do. We'll put the uh, links to these in the show notes, and you can check out our recommendations. All right. Hey, that's pretty much it for this uh, podcast. It went so fast. A um, couple of things before we get out of here. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the Sci-Fi Geeks Club. Uh, we have a simple page with all the different links to all the different places, but you can also go to iTunes and search out the Sci-Fi Geeks Club or Galactic Netcasts. Same with uh, Stitcher. Or just go to our website, gncasts.com, and click on subscribe. And uh, there you will find all the links to iTunes, to Stitcher, to uh, standalone apps. You can also subscribe via email. So whenever we have a, a new episode, the link gets emailed to you. Uh, we actually just had a new email subscriber this week. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's see, what else? Brad, help me out. What else am I missing? What else are you missing? Yeah, as far as what things I should touch on before we officially adjourn. Well, uh, have you mentioned how people can get a hold of us? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've mentioned that a few times, but I can again. Uh, 805-328-3966. You can, uh, check out uh, our voicemail number. That is what I just said. Or uh, galacticnetcasts at gmail.com. All right, uh, Marion Call, thank you for being our guest this week on the Sci-Fi Geeks Club. Thank you so much. Yes, this was a privilege. It was fun. <laughs> Tell people real uh, quick uh, where people can find you online, what you want them to know about you and your music, that kind of thing. Oh, sure. Well, I like long walks on the beach, but mostly Arctic beaches. That's how Alaskans... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, you can find me all over the internet. I'm at MarianCall.com. I'm on Twitter constantly as uh, at MarianCall. Uh, I have a Facebook page, Facebook.com slash MarianCallMusic. And if you want to know where my next few concerts are, uh, you can check uh, MarionCall.com or follow me one of those places, or better yet, find a uh, fanbridge. Call. Sorry, sorry, MarionCall.fanbridge.com. I'll put. Can we put that in the program notes, maybe? 
That's yes. the best way to not miss a concert because I go, I ha I play all 50 states. I play all over Canada and Europe, um, and uh, it's I will probably play near you sometime. And the shows are really fun. So next up, I got Houston, and uh, a spin up the Eastern Seaboard from Atlanta to Boston, hitting all the uh, all the major cities there. And uh, I'll be in Seattle. I'll probably do a West Coast tour in spring. I'm probably going to Europe next spring. It's a busy busy year. So yeah. I, I suggest Canada. Marianne. <laughs> oh, I'm a big fan of Canada. Ottawa, <laughs> Ottawa, and sp in sp sp specifically. Ottawa sp specifically. Yes. All right, yeah. sounds good. Sounds good. I can, I can do that. I'll see you there. Okay. I've played in Ottawa at a comic book shop a couple times, actually. Oh, I think that's my comic book store, actually. It might be. Which one? Uh, the comic shop, I think. Yeah, the the comic shop. Yes, yeah. I have played at the comic shop in uh, Ottawa twice, I think. Boom. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've mostly played comic shops in. Canada actually because for a while there it was legal and not legal to play in a lot of other places but now I can play anywhere so because you guys are nicer than we are so <laughs> <laughs> all right it, it's uh, true uh, that's gonna do it for this episode of the uh, sci-fi geeks club I'm Dave Nelson on behalf of Brad Corey hang on Matt but uh, who else is on the list Anessa Gregor Mark and JF and uh, Marianne, thank you for joining us again, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.